Hello, and welcome everyone to today's web seminar, Successful Test Automation Practices from Innovative Brands, sponsored by TAPQA. I'm your host and moderator, Sarah Crocker. Today's speakers are Angie Jones, Mike Wagner, and Kirk Walton. Before I introduce our speakers, let me explain this console. The three panels on your screen can be moved around and resized to your liking. At the bottom of your console is a widget toolbar. By clicking the handouts widget in the middle, you can download a PDF of the speaker slides. If you experience any technical issues, please let us know by typing in the questions and answers panel on the left. This is also how you'll submit questions for our speakers. There will be a Q&A session at the end, so feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. To optim optimize your bandwidth for the best viewing experience, please close any unnecessary applications you have running in the background. This event is being recorded and will be made available to watch on demand. Once the recording is ready, you'll get an email with instructions on how to access the presentation. Now for our speakers. Angie Jones is a senior developer advocate at AppliTools. She specializes in test automation strategies and techniques. She shares her wealth of knowledge by speaking and teaching at software conferences all over around the world, writing tutorials and technical articles on angiejones.tech, and leading the online learning platform Test Automation University. As a master inventor, Angie is known for her innovative and out-of-the-box thinking style, which has resulted in more than 25 patented inventions in the U.S. and China. In her spare time, Angie volunteers with Black Girls Code to teach coding workshops to young girls in an effort to attract more women and minorities to tech. Mike Wagner is a test architect and principal consultant with TAPQA. He has over 13 years of experience as a software tester, engineer, developer, and architect. He is primarily focused Oh, sorry, I add the slide. He is primarily focused on driving innovative test automation practices and strategies within a number of organizations ranging from software to hardware. He enjoys sharing his technical prowess with industry colleagues and has given several technical presentations on test automation strategies and uh, oh, I lost my <laughs> presentations on test automation strategies and best practices. His areas of expertise are software testing, artificial intelligence, test automation, and open source technologies. Kirk Walton has 20 years experience in the IT services industry, starting as a Lotus Notes consultant in 1999. His experience includes consulting, recruiting, marketing, and consulting services leadership. Kirk is incredibly passionate about, about the people aspects of the IT services industry and about building teams and help, helping organizations and individuals to find the perfect fit with one another. He established the recruiting and marketing practices at TAPQA, a national consulting firm exclusively focused on QA, test automation, and DevOps. Now with that, I'd like to hand it over to our speakers. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. First, I think we were going to get started out with a poll question for everybody, just so we can get to know our audience a little bit better today. And um, <clears throat> not sure if you can see the, the poll just yet, but the question that we had uh, is, when you look at your organization when it comes to test automation, how mature is your organization? So one is, we're just beginning, we're not automating at all, we're pretty much 100% manual. And five is we are a well-oiled machine when it comes to automation. So as those roll in, I am going to hand it over to Angie Jones. Thank you, Kirk. All right, let's share my screen. Do you see it? Yes. What do you see? <laughs> Hold on. Let's make sure I'm sharing the right thing. Okay. All right. And Angie, you see just, it? Uh, yep, yep, we see it. So, okay, uh, great. Look like look like the majority of the folks were kind of falling into the two to three range. So, uh, kind of you know, certainly most automating, but not quite at the well-oiled machine phase yet. So that's great. I think this presentation is going to be a, a great. Uh, 
you know, certainly, a, a, I think, a great fit for, for everybody here. Nice. Great. Um, so, hi, everyone. I'm Angie, uh, Automation Architect at Apple Tools. And one of the things that I love most about my role is that I travel all over the world meeting and consulting with engineering teams and discussing the challenges that they face. And one thing I've realized about building quality software is that the struggle is real. So everyone is trying to figure out how to rapidly produce software that is yet of high quality. So I had the idea to gather some best practices from some of the top companies in software, financial services, healthcare, gaming, and entertainment verticals. And that's what I'll share with you today. What these elite and innovative development teams are doing. And uh, Kurt and, uh, and, and Mike, they are joining in on this discussion. And so I'll present the research and then love to hear from these guys on what they're actually seeing out in the real world and how it compares or contrasts to um, the research. All right, so let's jump right in. For starters, 100% of the companies that I researched employ automated tests to expedite their release cycles. Now, when the goal is to release software on this continuous cycle, test automation is a must have, right? There simply isn't enough time to manually test every new feature, as well as manually execute regression tests to make sure that existing functionality isn't broken. So these teams, they invest an extensive amount of effort into automating their tests so that they're confident in their product each time they deploy. Now, I know from personal experience how difficult it is for developers to find the time to write tests and also how difficult it is to have test teams writing the code to automate tests. So I inquired about this a bit more to just determine how are the teams overcoming these challenges. And every single one of these companies have their developers involved in writing tests. Now, most of them said that their developers take care of the unit tests while the QA team is responsible for writing the integration and the end-to-end -end test. And a whopping 60% of the team share that they no longer have the distinction between development and QA engineers. And instead, they have hybrid engineers. And their goal here is to have developers own all the testing of their code, as well as triaging and the maintenance of those tests. And what they discovered is what I already know and probably what you already know is that developers aren't the best at this, right? There's not much time and frankly, not much interest from developers to go beyond writing their unit tests. So many of these teams have had to bring in quality experts to help out. Now, I dug a bit more to learn how exactly are the quality advocates assisting here. And I got a variety of answers, but here are some of the common ones. So they help with writing test infrastructure by finding the best testing libraries, um, creating the test automation code base, and all of the utility functionality that the developers would need in order to write their tests. That way, is not such an overhead for the developers and they can just focus on cranking their tests out. They also coach the developers. So many of the computer science and bootcamp programs that graduated your developers didn't teach them how to test, unfortunately. So this is a huge hurdle for developers who may have good intentions and actually want <laughs> to test their code. Now, they might not ever share this with you, but a lot of the developers that I speak with simply don't know how to test. Um, so the quality advocates specialize in this stuff and they can help them think of scenarios as well as teach them how to write good tests. 
And if you think that this might be a problem for your developers and you don't have a quality advocate just yet, send them to Test Automation University. It's free online learning platform um, that provides courses on this very thing. And then finally, the advocates develop testing strategies for the team. So they help them assess risk and come up with a plan of attack on what should be tested and how thoroughly. They also have this big picture view, which is greatly needed because your developers are zoned in on their features and their tests. So someone needs to consider how these features actually interact with one another so that more sophisticated tests can be developed. And someone also needs to strategize on which tests automatically run, right? Given certain pull requests. So these advocates, they, they do that and they also help out with keeping the test suites relevant by pruning out tests that are no longer of high business value. So uh, Kirk and, and Mike, what do you guys think about um, this? What are you seeing? Do you see where um, there's more testers writing all of the automation or is it something that is, uh, developer's responsibility? What are you seeing out in the field? Sure, I'm seeing more of a collaboration between devs and QA and they're really sharing the automation duties. Uh, I definitely see where developers are very excited to do testing but might not specifically know, understand like the concepts of um, certain types of testing, uh, specifically like integration testing. So we get asked all the time, can we do integration testing? and there used to be like an unwritten rule that I come across where QA was strictly UI testing or manual testing or unofficially assisting with integration testing, whereas the developers would handle all the unit and integration tests. But now there's this tonal shift that I've seen uh, where QA is assisting with integration testing on top of handing or handling the additional tests like UI and APIs and stuff like that, uh, which is actually a really great shift and is really kind of gluing the two teams together. Mm. Mike? Oh, that was me. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, <Yeah. laughs> oh, sorry. Kirk? <laughs> we sound pretty similar. Yeah. No, so, I mean, Angie, we, we've certainly seen QA teams keep automation strictly to the QA group, but what you really need is it's, it requires a special skill set to do that. Uh, you know, the SDET and test engineering role, which is, which is a very hard skill set uh, to find and, and, and in a lot of cases cultivate as well. Uh, I mean, we, we're always on the lookout for top notch that's and it and it's hard to it's certainly hard to find uh so that's yeah. where i think uh you know if you have qa professionals that have that coding gene uh it's it's really a you know good good time to identify those folks and like you mentioned of course test automation university that's a great place uh to send those folks to build a skill set over time uh but to get started quickly bringing in training bringing in consulting uh to accelerate those efforts that that really helps a ton i mean that's what we're brought in to do with a lot of our clients is mm -hmm. to be that qa advocate and provide the expertise and the mindset to coach developers on how to put together great tests um you know and like you said some for some developers thinking like a tester comes naturally but that's far from universal um mm -hmm. and this is where qa professionals really can play a, a strong role and be a part of the test automation process without getting into coding. Uh, you can still play a critical role by building the strategy and identifying the tests that need to be automated and working with developers in creating those automatable test cases. Uh, so we've seen great automation practices with clients that we work with where you combine the skills of the engineers, uh, both the test engineers and developers, and then you combine the combine that with a test strategy that's really driven by QA uh, and, and QA professionals. Mm. Now, let me ask this. When when uh, the, the, the testers or your team, let's just say your team, when your team goes in and kind of plays this quality advocate role and you're uh, assisting the developers on how to think about testing, how to come up with tests, how to write good tests, are they then more receptive to the process or the, the task at hand where they need to do some of the testing? Or are they still kind of like, eh, I just don't want to do it? Yeah, I think uh, most developers are pretty receptive to learning and improving the quality of their projects. Uh, I think it's really important that they um, 
just mainly they just don't have a, some may not have a full understanding of what tests need to be placed other outside of unit tests or certain integration tests. So I think that being able to educate them and be able to show them how to test certain uh, styles is um, pretty eye opening to a lot of devs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like you said, I mean, I think it's everybody, you know, they, they want to release great software and they understand that quality assurance and, and testing and making sure that the product that goes out to the field is as good as it can be. I mean, it's important for everybody. So um, certainly you have some that just kind of immediately have this, uh, you know, stigma or whatever about QA, but for the most part, uh, you, the teams that we work with have done a great job of identifying folks that uh, are going to be a better fit for test automation than others, perhaps. And then those kind of those people become the the champions within the development team to work with QA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. OK, let's go to the next point. Um, I wanted to make sure when I was talking with these companies that we were actually talking about more than just unit tests, right? So I inquired about which tests these companies uh, are automating. And every one of the companies automated their unit, their web, and their API tests. So yay them. 80% <laughs> of the ones who developed mobile apps automated their mobile tests. 80% of the companies that had these reusable web components, um, they automated tests for those. However, there was very little effort by the core development teams to automate the non-functional tests, right? So areas like security, accessibility, performance, these were mostly handled by separate groups like centers of excellence. So guys, what do you all see um, as far as this? Do you know any core teams that are kind of automating all of the tests, all of the different types of tests, or uh, does your experience fall in line with the research here? Yeah, definitely we see a much, this is Mike, by the way, uh, definitely we've seen, or we've seen a much wider variety of tests being automated with our clients, definitely web, API, uh, unit tests, um, but in particularly, we've seen a, an, a, an uptick in specifically making sure that the integration between those are being automated. So, for example, we have a client that's using a monolithic application and uh, we were breaking it down. Or they're breaking it down into microservices. So there's a real need to be able to validate between those services uh, as well as the performance side. So um, we've also seen a small uptick in automating performance testing during the development process and not just the end. So not a one off scenario. Uh, I've been a part of teams who wait uh, until way too long into the project to start performance testing, uh, which usually causes headaches down the road when performance becomes the priority. Uh, and the teams that I've seen be successful with that has been um, when they put focus on it and get a baseline and an SLA in place early. Um, they're usually the teams that don't struggle when performance becomes a priority, which is kind of a surprise because usually performance is not looked at um, under the under importance right away, but later on in the, in the process. And it's nice to see that happening now. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right. So I did some research last year on top programming languages used in test automation. And this included all sorts of companies, not just the mature top dog companies, right? And the vast majority of the teams were using Java with 44% actually. And while JavaScript was certainly on the rise, it came in at number two, which was only 15%. This was really interesting compared to what the top dogs are using. So all of them use JavaScript. <laughs> and uh, some of the companies, they have teams that use other languages in addition to JavaScript for things like native mobile testing and APIs, but for their web app tests, it's JavaScript. So I inquired why this is, and they explained that their web developers are JavaScript programmers, right? So some companies even said that they had these legacy test frameworks built in other languages and their developers wouldn't touch it. And when they switched to JavaScript, the developers became more engaged. So I found this really interesting because it aligns with what some thought leaders have been preaching for years. And I'll admit, guys, like I've like I've been a bit stubborn over my career and I tend to go for the language that the automators will be most comfortable in. 
But it seems perhaps I need to rethink that when I want the developers to actually contribute. And to be fair, JavaScript tools have gotten much better in recent years, right? Uh, so what are you all seeing as far as uh, programming languages? Does TabQA cover like different programming languages or do you guys specialize in a certain one? What are you seeing? No, we're a pretty uh, agnostic group. So we're definitely do see an uptick in JavaScript, kind of similar to what your research shows here. Um, and it's always, you're, I think you're right on the nail there with saying that um, the reason that the automation language is the same as the dev language is because you really want that parity between the two. Uh, you want to be able to let the devs write tests and the automation get people write tests as well. Um, We've also seen a slight uptick in Python for automation purposes as well, uh, mainly probably because it's um, pretty lightweight and easy to learn right off, mm -hmm. right off the cuff. And then, um, <clears throat> and then also as automation space begins to expand, Python is also appearing to be like the chosen language for AI efforts and stuff like that. So I think as as frameworks begin to expand out, I think a lot of people will start adopting it. Uh, it's maybe in a hybrid approach with their with their frameworks. Yeah, it's interesting that JavaScript really has taken off. I think I think a big part of that is it seems like at the university level, um, you know, full stack development is taught, and, and particularly at boot camps. And, and we uh, we've recruited a number of folks who have uh, gone through a boot camp program that have uh, you know background now in full stack development, and you know, it's heavy JavaScript then. So I think mm -hmm. just that more and more people that's that's kind of becoming the language of choice of what they're learning, uh, and they're bringing that to their they're bringing that to their jobs, and uh, more and more as as development is done on on JavaScript, I think it just makes sense then to marry what you're doing for automation with what the you know the the language of choice is with an organization. Um, and another thing is, and you don't have it on this list. I think you had it on the the previous one. Um, you know, a, a language like C Sharp. I mean, if you're a large enterprise and you're heavily reliant on Microsoft then it also makes sense to build your automation suites using the language that you're going to have your development teams using for the most part. So, so we do see, you know, C sharp a fair amount, you know, particularly with Microsoft shops, but like you, like Mike said, definitely an uptick in JavaScript. And I think a big part of that is just that more and more people are just, you know, are, are using that right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, um, I've done some JavaScript like back in the day, but Java is definitely my my baby. <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. as I'm seeing the trends, I realized really quickly like, oh, I better brush up on my my JS. And so um, I did that last year. But yeah, it's definitely I think anybody who is um, looking for like trends or, or what's on the rise or what skills should I be learning, this is definitely one that you shouldn't ignore. All right. Yeah, I would agree. And I think just and one one more point on that. It's just in in general, I mean, we we try to recommend, and as we're we're if we're building a framework for an organization, we're gonna we're gonna code it in the language of of choice. I mean, we really look around and say, okay, you have these folks that that's what they specialize in. You have more of these developers than anything else. That's that's what we would recommend to uh, to use for the main automation suite. Mm hmm. Right. 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 Um. Yeah, and I think it's just going to become like a more marketable skill, even if it's not in your current role. You know, when you go to look for your next position, it, it doesn't hurt to have that background because that might be what people are looking for. All right, so let's go into tools. People love to talk about tools when you talk about automation. <laughs> so for web automation, Cypress had the most adoption with 60%, followed by Selenium and WebDriver.io with almost 40%, and a tiny percentage used their own in-house libraries. And these were mostly seen by the gaming companies. Mobile was split evenly across Appium in the native tools, Expresso for Android, and Apple's XCUI test for iOS. And Apply Tools was used by all of the top dog companies for visual testing. So 100% of the companies use Apply Tools alongside with their testing framework for web tests. And then 60% also use Apply Tools for their component tests. None of the teams are using a co-list, record, or playback approach, which is not really surprising considering their developers are the ones who are writing the tests. Um, okay, guys, what, what do you see with tools? What's the most popular one that you're getting called for? 
Yeah, I'd have to say our most common one right now for web specifically is Selenium. Selenium's still pretty, pretty mm-hmm. much the top dog that we see all the time. Uh, and it, it makes sense. It's, we see it so much that we actually build um, accelerators to be able to bypass a lot of the setup process for Selenium at TAP. And then we are definitely seeing a, an uptick with a small number of our clients using Cypress. Uh, I think it's because it's, it's new on the block, but it's, it's also very fast. It's a, it's a nice JavaScript um, runner. I think, I don't know what the limitations are of it. I think it goes uh, Chrome only. Uh, as far as visualization testing, obviously we do uh, see a lot of Apti tools being utilized um, as well as with the, um, using AI integration to get uh, using convolutional neural networks to tie into those test libraries above. So Selenium and Cypress, um, we've done a couple of workshops on that where we can uh, kind of give visualization testing to the test libraries like Sel- Selenium and Cypress. Uh, mobile, for sure, we definitely see, Appium seems to be the de facto standard on our clients, though we are seeing a, a pretty fairly good uptick in native testing. So, uh, which makes sense because native testing is fast and it's quick, it's integrated into the code. It's not like this separate process that needs to spin up and run. Um, XCUI test and Espresso, both of those specifically have really improved since they came out. When they first came out, they weren't really beloved, but now they're, they've are they come <laughs> into their own and really, really started to uh, uh, make some tracks in the, in the snow. Yeah, those, uh, those mobile tools have come a long way. I remember back when... Um, mobile automation was like the new thing and how awful those tools were back then but you know they're definitely starting to improve um as far as cypress they have they do now support um more than just chrome which is great um and it seems developers really love this tool so i i was surprised that it was this popular with the people i researched but and thinking about it, I can kind of rationalize that because the developers, I don't know, for whatever reason, they don't like Selenium, right? <laughs> um, yeah. A lot of them haven't even tried it. So it's just kind of like, oh, I don't like it or oh, whatever. Um, and so, yeah, sometimes the new sexy tool is the one that people go for. <laughs> so it seems like developers really enjoy using Cypress. And I, I, I know them both, Selenium and Cypress. And I can't say that I prefer Cypress over Selenium, but hey, um, as long as people are testing their code, I'm all right. <laughs> Use whatever tool right. you want. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, let's see what else we got here. Um, yeah, so it was it was interesting to see that high percentage of companies using Cypress, considering until you know a couple of months ago it only supported Chrome, like you said. So I asked the companies about their strategies when it comes to testing across multiple browsers and viewport sizes. And a few said that they no longer do it, citing things like flakiness and wasted time and effort. And um, some cited the lack of browser diversity because many of the browsers are using Chromium these days. Others use device farms um, from cloud providers. So this was by far the most popular answer. And many are using Apple Tools new ultra fast grid. So what are you all seeing in terms of cross platform? Do people still care about this? Is this still important in 2020? Yeah, I think it's been, we kind of see a mixed bag. So some of our uh, clients use obviously cloud providers like SAS Labs or even set up their own local frameworks or, or local grids. Uh, and then some just don't really see the ROI in it. So, and I think some of that might be what their target audience is. So if they're targeting internal desktop users, they could probably um, mm-hmm. target to like an enterprise, they might target a specific browser, but uh, on the other side, you might have a mobile um, app that you need to target multiple devices. Uh, so I think it really, we really see the difference when it comes on to what the target audience of the um, client is looking for. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, all of the elite teams that I spoke with are practicing continuous integration or continuous deployment, also known as CI/CD. Um, this enables them to release their features to their users faster. And again, test automation is a key enabler to be able to do this but none of them have this set and go type of process, right? They aren't really running their thousands of tests on every single pull request, for example. 
They're using more sophisticated practices to execute the tests which are related to the area that has been modified. So some of the practices that were cited were things like tagging the test by feature area. So for example, if a shopping cart feature is checked in, then all of the tests that are marked shopping cart are executed, right? Um, some use code coverage tools and map between the tests and the source code so that they know what, which tests are associated with this particular feature. Now, the rest of the tests that they have, even though they be, may not be running as part of like this whole CICD process, they're still executed regularly, right, throughout the days. For example, uh, one team said they're running like every three hours, and some people said, you know, like twice a day. So still executing those tests every day, but not necessarily um, all of them at every single pull request. Now, the vast majority of the elite companies I spoke with are using Jenkins, and they did mention that a few one-off teams in their companies are using other tools like AWS, Team City, Kubernetes, Google Cloud. So, guys, what are you seeing as far as CICD? I, I consider this one like probably uh, one of the top indicators of the maturity of a test automation project. So, if yep. you have your yeah, if you have your test basically gating your integration or your deployment, that means you have quite a bit of trust in those tests, which means they've proven their worth and are, are reliable and stable. So do you talk with teams who have gotten to this point? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we I would say many of the companies we work with, you'd probably consider to be in the top dog category. But you know, I think it's important to stress that not everyone we work with is there either. I mean, there's a lot of organizations that have that as a goal uh, and we're brought in to help those organizations as well. So just just that you're not there yet. That's, you know, that's that's totally fine. I mean, there's plenty of companies that aren't. Um, but I think, you know, most of the organizations we, we work with are were brought in to, uh, you know, start from the ground up when it comes to an efficiency ICD process. Uh, you know, that's I mean, ultimately, the end goal is let's 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 get there for sure. Uh, Mike, I know you, you, you've had a couple of clients here recently that you've worked with that um, you know have some examples of at least of, of uh, things that we've seen lately. Yeah, I mean, mainly those examples are about where usually the client will have the test automation suite um, set up, but it's not actually in the client or in the CI process yet. And the our work will really come into helping them implement that into the CI process so that it runs together. Um, but a lot of stuff, the way that a lot of teams are using it now, I'm seeing is like you said, tags, um, tagging specific sections of tests. Uh, so when a developer checks in, basically it, it uh, associates to that tag and only runs the spe specific set of tests for that. Um, for the tool side, I think Jenkins is definitely the uh, big one here, but we also work again with a fair amount of uh, C sharp environments. And for that scenario, they use Azure DevOps, uh, which is actually fairly, um, a fairly good tool as well. Um, so I think that in the overall process, I think I don't I don't think I've ever seen the actual full dream of you know when you go in and you talk to people about what they want for CI/CD, they throw you this dream that they're like I want to check in my code and then put it straight to production after it passes all the tests or something like that. And mm -hmm. obviously that's never been a scenario that I've seen personally because there's always that gate before production because nobody really fully trusts the CI/CD process at that point. I don't, Angie. Have you seen any scenarios like that where they've they've had that full trust? Yeah, it's it's rare. So um, the companies I spoke with, they were there. Where it's like, yep, we we have our tests down pat. They don't flake out on us. If they fail, it's with just cause, and they had gotten to that point. But yeah, um, it's really difficult. I have a, a whole talk on just that. Like, how do you get your tests to this level? of maturity so that they can be like this trusted gatekeeper um, without the manual intervention. Yeah, I agree. I think that's what I see too. I mean, the confidence in the test being able to go through the whole pipeline, I think uh, that takes a while to, to gain that trust for the, oh, any yeah. team. I think. Certainly. And I usually recommend that people don't try to start there. Like, like I said, this is this is an indicator of really high maturity. So I wouldn't just start my automation initiative and say, oh, let's start blocking integrations <laughs> with my <Yeah>. crappy test. <laughs> but I would. Uh, <laughs> right. I would 
Yeah, you start kind of just running them locally on your own machine, right? How does it go there? You know, run it more than one time. How's it looking? And um, I've even done like private bills where the team isn't watching this, but at least it's off my machine and I can look at this bill and have it run maybe every hour or so um, and see like just how stable those tests really are. And if, oh, they're running smooth, we don't have any issues, they're not flaking out on us, then maybe you can progress to uh, the stage, the big stage, as I call it, where you're putting your tests within the CICD pipeline. All right. So uh, let's see what else we got. Another cool technique that a lot of the top dogs are using is uh, feature flagging. Right. So this allows them to push to production, but hide the feature from their customers. And with this in place, they can do a more thorough job of testing that feature, right? And testing it in the environment where your customers live. So a lot of us, I know we have our test systems, we have our dev systems or whatever, and this is where we usually do our testing and we cross our fingers and hope for the best when it's pushed <laughs> to the production. Um, but feature flags allows you to go ahead and push it there, but you know, kind of hide it from your users and just have your testers or your developers to be able to um, test it in that environment. Or you can even release it to a small subset of customers and then monitor to see if there are any issues, right? So there's only so many scenarios we can think of as human beings. And when you let your customers who, you know, really want to use it, let them use it in whichever way they see fit, you start seeing like more realistic scenarios. And then you can kind of observe this behavior without it being a big blowback to like all of your customers, right? So some of the benefits that were cited by using feature flags were the ability to deploy faster as they didn't have to wait for other dependent components to be done before they were able to release their features. So are you guys seeing anyone using feature flags? So I, I, it's very rare for us to, to come across this. Uh, not rare, but it's not as common. I've definitely worked on teams that use feature flags and they are fantastic. Uh, there is that extra level that you have to verify that when the feature's off in the lower environments that you're verifying that the features and breaking anything else by being off, but having the code implemented. Um, but yeah, I think this is a fantastic feature um, as far as overall being able to test something and maybe not being ready for it to release yet. It's also really nice. I've seen when we when you do release it to a specific subset of trialed users, you can always it's almost like a nice UAT from it, too, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um... It's not something that's very common. I've only worked on one team where we did it. That's when I was at Twitter. And um, it was it was much, it was, I, I won't say better, but it was really interesting. It was like a different technique to, to testing. Like um, one, just having the freedom to test it in the, the real prod environment was great. But the, the better use case was that I was able to then monitor how the feature was behaving. So kind of like, you know, looking at, uh, database trends and things like this to be able to determine, okay, where do I even focus my automation initiatives, right? So now I have some data telling me like, oh, this, this is how people are using it, or this is the most common scenario. So now I know like, oh, that's a great one to automate, for example. Yeah. And I think the time that I worked on a team that had it, uh, it was really nice, especially if something, say something went wrong. So something was broken. It, was, it wasn't you had to do a full deployment, you just pushed a config file up and it would switch off the feature and then you could fix the issue and then push the config back up and it would work again. So it's definitely really nice for fast turnarounds in that, in that regard. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I don't see it very commonly. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, so that's all the research that I had. I wanna leave us some time for questions. Um, Let's see. Yeah, and we have some great questions in the in the Q and A room. I'm, I'm just gonna, I'll just, just, yeah, just yeah, send them your way. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So, 
you know, for this, this is great for both of you. Uh, what's your advice for QAs to introduce quality assurance to developers? I mean, we talked a little bit about the role of the QA advocate, um, but to jumpstart that effort with an organization, what are some, you know, quick steps that uh, that a QA professional could, or our QA leadership could do to um, uh, to create that quality advocacy within an organization? Right. Uh, yeah, I think the first steps is really kind of understanding why they don't have quality assurance in place first. Right. So you you really got to act as like the cheerleader for quality assurance when you walk into a scenario like that, because um, you want to make sure that, you know, you can do your research and f figure out like how much downtime has the system had or whatever has been caused by the poor quality of the of the application. That that always helps to have in your back pocket because that can help you with um, letting them know you know, you're losing money by not having high quality. Um, it's really mainly just being the the advocate. So when they come and ask you, you got to, it, it's nice to be able to explain uh, approaches and strategies that you can put in place that'll make streamline the entire development process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely one of those um, culture types of things, right? It's a, it's a yeah. culture thing to be able to get people to do it. Like, Introducing new tools or saying uh, I'll code in JavaScript for you or whatever, <laughs> like that's not <laughs> enough. <laughs> that's not enough, I think, to like move the needle the way that you want to. Um, the way that I've approached trying to change culture is to start really small. Start with like one team. Don't try to change the entire company all at once. Start with just your team. Can you get? someone on board right and sometimes i'll go to i won't try to make it a whole team discussion there's too many opinions but first i want to have someone on my side from the other side right not to say like it's us versus them but you know what i mean um but like going to maybe like the team lead or the architect or something like that and if you're able to convince that person then you have an ally on that side who will help you know kind of fight this with you or whatever. And so you kind of just bring it up then maybe like in a, a team meeting or something, hey, I'm thinking about doing this or whatever, whatever. Um, hopefully that that person you've identified will, will advocate with you and then you try it out. If it's great, you take that as a case study and you want to present this to lots of teams, right? So if your company does things like town halls or, you know, all hands meetings or something like that, hey, can we present something, you know, and get permission to do that quick little, don't do a whole hour presentation. If you could do like a little five to 15 minute blurb and show your pro your progress, right? Your stats. People don't want to hear like about the, the coolest tool or whatever like that. They want to hear like what problems did you solve? Put those charts up. People love numbers and graphs and things. Make them mm -hmm. colorful. Put that up. And, you know, uh, then you get buy in from from other people. They want to do it. Then you, you're not even trying to pitch it like this is what everybody should be doing. You're just like, look at what we did. We had great success. And what you're really saying is we're better than you all. <laughs> and, and and people want to, they want to be good too, right? So they, they might say, okay, how do we do that too? And I found great success using that approach. Right. Well, and again, I think it just goes back to you. I mean, you, you want you want your product to be great. I mean, no one wants to be, uh, you know, developers across the board. No one wants to be on a team that they create an app and uh, the app is generally panned by its audience. I mean, no one wants to be a part of that. So, I mean, just the understanding of, uh, you know, quality across the board is, um, you know, I mean, I think, you know, now that release cycles have shrunk to the levels that they're at now, uh, you know, and, and quality is, you know, become maybe a little, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's become in some cases more difficult. I think it's it just, it's, it's shown the importance of uh, quality assurance practices over the last, you know, 10 to 20 years or so. Uh, one question that I, I like here, and I think it's it's a similar question, but really specifically for legacy software, how do you advocate quality? How do you advocate quality assurance for legacy software automation? Yeah, um, that's even harder to do, right? Uh, <laughs> oh, one thing is that the the code is not going to 
it's probably not going to be very testable, meaning like uh, it wasn't built with testability in mind. That's what I found a lot of times when I'm working on legacy code bases. So it's really a, a difficult uphill battle to even start an automation project on um, such a code base. Yeah, I agree. I think it's more of like a culture fight at that point, right? Because if it's legacy code, there's probably it's probably very old and there's probably a few people that have worked on it that have obviously not seen quality as the priority. So then you kind of have to make a culture shift to be able to get people on board. Yeah. And you got to get this buy in because basically you're going to be automating like this uh backlog of regression tests right um i've done that before i've done that and it's been kind of like a separate team so we're not embedded in the agile teams because they're working on new features right so we're kind of behind and working on the old tests just so that we don't have to manually execute them all the time so there is some value in it it's just a really different approach A question that we have is, how do you do tests for real-time updated systems like Google Map routing? I mean, how, how do you, what are the best practices around automating something like that? That's so funny yeah, so, that they oh, Oh, I, was just I don't have about an answer. I'm gonna, let, I'm gonna let you answer. I'm just gonna say, like, my boss yesterday was like, "Angie, you can you do something on how do you automate maps?" Because I'm hearing a lot of people ask that, and I'm like, "What? What does he mean? He's hearing a lot of people ask that." But I guess, he, I guess he was right. Take it away. <laughs> sure. Well, I've never actually automated maps specifically, but my assumption would be under uh, all about how you set up the data prep, right? So it's got to be dynamic because maps change, people's locations change. So you'd want to approach it with a uh, ability to be able to prep data before you run the test to be able to, or dynamically gather the data during the test to be able to um, appropriately get the information that you need and then tie it by some sort of weight. That was, that was, yeah, what, that's what I had. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I was going to, I haven't, I haven't given this much thought yet. So this is something that I would probably take on, but, um, I was gonna, my first thought was to use visual testing to be able to um, test the maps. Otherwise, cause it's a very visual type of thing, right? Yeah, right. Question, are there maturity models to assess test automation maturity? I assume within uh, within an organization or within a suite. I mean, that's, that's something that we do at TAPQA. We, we do test automation assessments as part of our consulting engagements. That's usually how we start an engagement with a client. So definitely, you know, we'd be a good company to turn to for that. Um, Angie, I'm not sure if you have, you know, anything that you use that's, uh, you know, kind of your own uh, system as well. I didn't, I didn't follow the question. Oh, like a maturity model, or, or is there something that's like formal oh, that oh, you yeah. can use to assess okay, okay, an organization's yeah. automation? I mean, that's like I said, that's something that we right, do. Right, right, that's, right, that's right. a big, big part of our, uh, you oh, know, is our, it really? our initial oh, engagement. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I I actually put together something um, like based on this research where you can measure yourself on like the things that I talked about in this talk. And uh, I assign like points to, or like weights to each of those research points. And then you can be able to like calculate it and, and measure your maturity. So um, that is on the Applitudes blog. I'll probably send a link out after the talk. But yeah, that's, that's one approach. Yeah, and I think like the, I mean, the short approach or like the short version of what we usually do for assessments is really we, we go in and we talk to everybody in the team, uh, across or teams across the organization, really, and really just kind of gather information, right? We want to make sure that we have, uh, do you guys have the CI set up or CI CD set up? Do you have reporting in place? Uh, what languages are you guys using? What's your confidence of the tests that are already written? If there's any legacy tests written? Uh, it's really just kind of assessing where you're at and then uh, you're kind of just checking those boxes as far as seeing how far you are along the lines of maturity. Yeah. Cool. And that's something, I mean, um, anyone that's, oh, go ahead, Angie, sorry. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. 
Oh, I was saying, um, you know, happy. I mean, if anyone would be interested in such a thing, I mean, certainly happy to follow you after the presentation on that. Yeah, that's a it's a nice thing to have. You should definitely reach out to these guys um, to get that for your your team because they seem to have like a, a more formal approach. And um, we used this at at uh, one company, like company wide. There was like um, metrics and things that every team can basically rate themselves on their maturity level and see like what they needed to do to improve. So it's definitely helpful and and helps give you like this goal of um what you're trying to do with automation because a lot of times we can get sidetracked and the goal becomes automating right <laughs> and you forget why you're even automating things so yeah definitely reach out to those guys oh thanks uh jana asks one of the big issues i've seen with feature flags is around security companies forget to secure the configuration page and it goes out into production where the public can access it uh have either of you experienced that I have any, any thoughts on, you know, how, how to test that if you had. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's something that's, I mean, I guess it depends on the, if it's in your area. I've never, I've never experienced it firsthand, but uh, usually we were pretty cautious about when we turned on and off feature flags, but I mean, yeah, that really, you just need to validate. I mean, obviously the first step would be to validate as soon as you deploy that it's not on, but um, that's, I've never had it happen to me in, in in my time. The question from John is companies are making their devs do all or most of the testing. I mean, quite a few, as, as we talked about, quite a few companies have. Do you think this model could work for most companies in the long term? Um, and if so, what would you need for that to be successful? Or if not, um, why not? I think maybe for the first part, um, just devs may not have time to fully do all the testing that they need to do. I think from what I've seen in the past, a lot of developers have time to write the unit tests. And then once it gets into like integration testing and stuff like that, uh, because yeah. the integration testing and the rest of it takes so much time uh, and can be flaky and you got to go back and maintain it every once in a while. I think that developers just don't have the time, but Angie, do you have feedback on that one? Yeah, it's it's really a full time job. Like all of this stuff is full time jobs, and I get a little bit annoyed by the whole like, like I'm all for collaboration, but when you're trying to basically hire one person to do the job of three or four people, I don't think that's fair. You know, um, I often tell managers that your Whoever's writing your automation is writing more code than the production dev, right? <laughs> because if you really think about it, the the dev is writing like this, you know, enough code to get the feature working, but then someone has to write like all of these integration and um, UI tests or whatever, API tests and covering various scenarios. So it's really, more work sometimes than writing the feature itself. And um, you're exactly right that this kind of time is not built into schedules for, for one person to do all of that work. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, and I think, you know, the QA profession, really, if we look at the just the numbers of people who have come into the field over the last 10 to 15, 20 years, it's it's no, there's no doubt it's grown. And there's a reason why it's grown. It's because it's a really important function of the software development life cycle. So, I mean, yeah, I can see smaller companies, you know, kind of tasking developers with doing it all. But I mean, if you have the ability to specialize, it's, it's I think it's been proven time and time again, that's the way to go. Yeah. Uh, moving on. So TJ asks, what is a popular way to present automated test results that is beneficial for both management and developers? To present the results? Yes. Is there, I mean, anything that, uh, you know, is, is so something that, uh, and, and I guess, you know, TJ can maybe elaborate in the, in the Q&A box, but is that uh, you know I, I, what how I'm taking this question is uh, is there a way that um, is is kind of a universal report for both management and developers? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I TJ think in the past, <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. yeah, in the past, I think um, 
as far as like displaying your results and getting the automation results in the hands of management, I think you mainly you just want to like the target audience there specifically management probably won't care as much as what devs are looking for in certain statistics, but usually it's a, you know, you can add a, or you can utilize like a trending scenario where you're seeing like how your um, tests are passing over a certain amount of time or um, what, what areas of the application is failing on a, on a trend method. Um, uh, other than that, I think we've, I've also used, seen uh, dashboards used as well. So um, overall test runs for the month are, are up or down. Um, it's kind of a, you, when, you, when you're talking specifically to like management and stuff, you want a quick glance. You want them to be able to look at the report, fully understand it within 30 seconds. Otherwise, they'll probably not read everything. Not, not to saying that they don't want to read it. It's just their time is taken up throughout the day. So they only have a certain a finite amount of time to read that report, especially if it's a daily report or a weekly report. So um, being able to um, get your uh, metrics across quickly, I think is extremely important. Um, question, so in, in, in certainly if you don't feel comfortable answering this, go. it's okay. In terms of do's and don'ts, have there been any automated tools that don't perform well across the board? I mean, maybe like older tools, I guess. Um, I, I, I can't can't say that I can think of any that I would say, yeah, absolutely don't use that because there's tools that might be the perfect fit for some environments and just a terrible fit for others. But I don't know if you have any that you just say, you know, kind of avoid altogether. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have, I don't have any that I would say, oh, if, avoid this like the plague, right? But um, you're right, it's very contextual. For example, like, with the companies that I spoke with, none of them were using any codeless tools, right? So that didn't make sense for these companies. And we have to ask ourselves, why not? Like if these are the most successful companies with test automation and none of them are using a codeless approach, then what does that tell us? Like, um, and I, I just summed it up to, well, their developers are the ones who are coding and of course they, they code. So why do they need a codeless solution? Um, but there are some code the solutions that are pretty mature and are uh, doing very well for people who are looking for a, a, a no to low code solution to be able to do their test automation. Now, I can't attest to like how that scales long and in, in, in how it looks long term, but um, for for like a couple of tests, maybe I, I think the most I've seen somebody do with this is maybe like. 50 or so. Um, not to say that that's that there aren't people who are doing much more. I just haven't seen it. Yeah, right. I agree. I think like the task, I mean, these tools are created to do specific tasks. So they're, I, I completely agree with Angie. I think that you can't really compare apples to oranges in some certain scenarios. So you're not going to test your website with a mobile testing solution, right? So I mean, it's really a situational um, scenario on what tools to use. And it's really based on what your team is using. Right. So we're coming up at the end, close to the end of the hour. Um, we still have a lot of questions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on this one and then um, you know, <laughs> we'll leave it up to you, An Angie, Mike, if you still have time. But uh, I really like this one a lot. And, and we touched on it a little bit during the presentation. But is it reasonable to expect traditionally manual QA testers to transition into automated testing when they don't have any programming experience or skills? It seems difficult to embrace automated test culture without cleaning house for testers with past dev skills. I. I, I absolutely think that manual testers have a huge role to play in any QA department, including those that are going to move heavy into automation. As we talked about, manual testers in most cases can make the best QA advocates and help train developers that, I mean, if you, so if you have an organization that, okay, our QA team is awesome. However, no one has that coding gene, if you will. Uh, so we need to go turn or we need to go turn to the development team to find an engineer that can become a, an SDET or a test engineer. But in a lot of cases, those folks just don't have the natural ability to think like a tester. And that's where the QA advocate role is so important. And I think manual testers uh, play that role so well because they, they're just naturally trained and natural. It's just, it, it's, that's what they do is, is think about how do I break this and how do I think in terms of test cases? And then they can train uh, the developers to really do that well. 
Um, so I, I think, I mean, you know, test organizations, I, I think we've heard for years that, oh, manual testing is, is going to go away with automation and with AI. And I, I really don't see that being the case. Uh, I think it, uh, manual testers are going to have to focus on maybe different things. And that QA advocate role in working with test automation teams is one of those things. Uh, would you agree, Angie, Mike? I, yeah, um, okay. you go. yeah, I definitely, I, I agree with that, but here's the thing. Like if you don't want to code, like that's not something you're interested in, then yes, you don't let them push you into that, you know, play to your strengths and what it is that you enjoy doing with your career. And um, I think your skills are definitely needed in that whole quality advocate role or even, um, helping, like say that you do have S debts on the team. I collaborate with uh, my testers all the time, you know, cause I wanna, they have a better um, domain knowledge and, and things like this and can come up with better scenarios and stuff. And so we collaborate that way. Now, if you do want to call, like this is something you want to do, but you're just lacking that skill, definitely go to Test Automation University. I basically created that platform for this very persona, right? I'm a tester. I want to do automation. I don't know how. Teach me. And all the courses there are free, including programming courses. So I have a Java course, not to toot my own horn, but it is it had gotten rave reviews, like not just from um, people who want to do test automation, but even people who just want to go into development, period, right? And I teach that for the absolute beginner who has never coded a day in their life and they're able to pick it up, right? I have college professors who are sending their students to my course because I teach it better than they do. <laughs> but no, people can, mm -hmm. people can grasp it, right? People can grasp the concept. So if that's something you want to learn, then it's out there for you for free, right? So you, you're gonna have to put the time in and the initiative, if you can um, get that time at work, even better. But if not, sometimes you have to carve out your own personal time for what it is that you wanna do. Yeah, I think that was well said. I, I, think, uh, um, I think manual testers in general, I think are always gonna be uh, still needed. I think it's, I almost liken it to the current uh, conversation around AI and how AI is like this new revolution. And then automation testers are asking the same thing. You know, I think a, the, the benefit of having manual testers is that obviously they do have that domain knowledge, but they're also the ones that are helping out with writing out full test suites, right. Or, or helping us identify which candidates we can turn into automation later down the road. So I think there's always going to be a need for that type of person on the team. And sometimes the, the testers can transition almost into a hybrid BA role at that point for a manual tester. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have one last question. Um, <laughs> I, I <love> this. <laughs> um, and this, this comes from Jana, uh, and I think it's a great question and, and kind of a, a good way to sum this all up is, are there any specific metrics that you track to show the value of having a tester on a team versus a team with all devs that do testing? So as, as you mentioned, Angie, with the top dogs, I mean, you had, um, you know, those that were a collaborative effort and those were just, it was just developers doing the, uh, doing the automation. And I'm curious if you had any, yeah, any metrics or anything like that that kind of compared the two. I don't, but I would love to see something like that. Wow, it sounds like something that we can develop. <laughs> Mike, we'll have to yeah. work well, on there that. there you go. It's like <laughs> right. you got some homework. Yeah, I mean, it sounds guess, really you know, Certainly, yeah. Some, you know, I mean, we could, we could, you know, go back through our clients and everything, and, and probably, I mean, you know, we, I certainly think that most of our clients that have that collaborative approach do extremely well. Uh, we, we oftentimes get them started on, you know, what they, what they need to do to be successful. But yeah, I mean, with our teams, uh, you know, our clients and everything, I think just the collaborative approach that works really well. As far as like a metric of how to compare it to those who don't have QA doing that? That's that's a that's a great question. Um, sounds, like, well, sounds like something we should work on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, what? Uh, Angie, Mike wanted to wanted to say thanks. Um, you know, we can turn it back over to the folks at 
at uh, TechWall. But uh, really quick, yeah, I, I guess I, I, you know, quick plug and tap away. There's our contact info for Mike and I, if uh, any interest in, uh, I mean, certainly we do a lot of consulting and training around test automation. Uh, one of the things that we offer is our accelerator, which is a, a, a code that we've built that can actually shave weeks, if not months off the effort of building a framework by giving you a head start on that. Uh, we do a lot of work around test strategy, around automation strategy. And uh, as we talked about before, we do uh, offer a, uh, a free assessment, kind of a very high level approach or high level assessment to automation maturity uh, or test automation readiness if your organi organization isn't automating at this point. Um, we can be able to tell you kind of you know how close you are or what you would, what you would need to do to be able to automate. So feel free to reach out to us. You have our email addresses there. Uh, if it's a more technical question, that's uh, definitely the M Wagner email that you want to use, and <laughs> not the K Walton one. But um, and that's my <laughs> phone number too. So you know, feel free to reach out to me. Give me a call if you have any you know specific questions. Um, Angie, I, I, I want to put in another plug for your work with Test Automation University. Our folks at Tap QA, uh, from our more junior automators all the way up to fairly senior level folks, all see benefit in the courses there. And uh, it's wonderful what you've done for the test automation community with that. And just, uh, you know, so a big thank you for one, uh, thank you. And, and, and also just a, another plug for anyone that, um, you know, is looking at uh, just, you know, kind of, uh, you know, a chance to level up in their automation skills. That's a, it's a great place to turn. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Um, this was great. Thank you for having me. Um, hope that this information was useful to you. And I don't want anyone here to leave here like feeling discouraged. Um, this was research based on like top dogs, very successful companies with their test automation initiatives. But most of what we see is not on par with that. And that's okay, right? Hopefully this is something that's inspirational and kind of gives you maybe some ideas on how you can grow your initiative as well. Great. Yeah, thanks to the folks at TechWall right. for putting this on as well. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, that wraps up our session for today. Um, just as a reminder, it was it is being recorded, so it'll be available on demand shortly. I'd like to uh, give a big thanks to Angie Jones, Mike Wagner, and Kirk Walton for their time, and to TapQA for sponsoring this web seminar. And a big special thank you out to our audience for spending your time with us. We wish you a very great day and hope to see you at a future event. Thank you.